The suspect in Tuesday's horrific Brooklyn subway shooting made his first court appearance on Thursday. A judge ordered he remain in jail without bond on federal charges in relation to the worst crime on New York's subway system in nearly 40 years, a heinous act that left nearly two dozen people hurt. Of course, from a political and partisan perspective, this attack only adds fuel to the right-wing narrative that Democrats are soft on crime. Look, more violence in a big blue city. Defund the police did this. You're not safe with the Democrats. It's a narrative that Republicans have escalated since 2020 and the George Floyd protests. Watch. The pro-crime party. That's the focus of tonight's angle. We're seeing murders in our big cities, all Democrat run. All Democrat run. America's most beautiful cities are indeed being ruined um, by liberal policies. There's a direct line between death and decay and liberal policies. The American people know this crime wave is not some spontaneous event. It's been fed and fueled in multiple ways by the Democratic Party's far left turn. Yeah. Crime has risen during this pandemic, including in major cities that just happen to be blue. And the pandemic, surprise, has a lot to do with that rise. But what if I told you you're actually more likely to be killed in a red state than in a blue one? A new study by the center-left think tank Third Way found that murder rates are on average 40% higher in the 25 states Donald Trump won in 2020 than those that went for Joe Biden. Take Jacksonville in Florida, a red city with a Republican mayor. It had 128 more murders in 2020 than a city with a similar population, San Francisco, which is run by a Democratic mayor and often depicted as some sort of Mad Max lawless hellhole. Bet you haven't heard about Jacksonville in the news. And if you look at the 10 states with the highest murder rates in 2020, that was the last year with available data, eight of them voted for a Republican presidential nominee in every election this century. It's amazing, isn't it, how Republicans have managed to just brush these figures, these inconvenient facts, totally under the rug. I haven't even mentioned the fact yet that the largest increases in homicide rates were not in New York or L.A., but in rural Republican-led states like Montana and South Dakota. I mean, Republicans have done such a good job with selective storytelling and collective blaming of Democrats that both the quote-unquote liberal media and top Democrats themselves have totally bought into it. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police, it's to fund the police. Fund them. Fund them. Yeah, fund the police, because we're not doing it. Oh, if only I read the headlines, if only I, if I only listened to Joe Biden or only read headlines in the newspapers, I'd think that defunding efforts have led to a rise in crime. But time for a reality check. After the widespread calls to defund after George Floyd's death in 2020, cities from Austin to L.A. to New York to Dallas all reallocated police funding. Yes, defund was gaining steam, rhetorically at least. And then all those cities reversed course. L.A.'s police force saw a 3% boost to their budget last year. Both Austin and Dallas also raised their police budgets too, as did New York City, boosted by a whopping $200 million. Defund? What America has been seeing since last year across its major cities is a refunding of the police on steroids. So whatever rise in crime we're seeing now in 2022 has nothing to do with this mythical defunding we keep hearing about. But the narrative has stuck even among Democrats. It's catchy, it's easy, and it's even swooped up so-called progressive prosecutors along with it. Remember the deadly Sacramento mass shooting last week? Maybe you don't. We forget about mass shootings so quickly. But six people were killed and 12 injured just blocks away from the city's state capital. I wonder which progressive DA's policies led to that tragic incident. Oh, wait. The DA there is Anne-Marie Schubert, a tough-on-crime former Republican who left the party during Trump's presidency. She's now an independent. But that hasn't stopped her from blaming Democrats for a rise in the murder rate. Just listen to her on Fox & Friends in January, criticising Progressive DAs like L.A.'s George Gascon and San Francisco's Chesa Boudin. Well, I they want to dismantle the system. I mean, when they try to talk tough, it's, it's really just a show. Because when you actually follow them through with those cases, what we're seeing is that they're really not um, being tough on crime. What she conveniently did not mention was that homicides have also risen drastically in Sacramento County, her county. Last year, the city of Sacramento saw its highest murder rate for 15 years. 
What's happening here is that Republicans and a lot of Democrats are falling back on their lazy, tough-on-crime rhetoric and policies before progressive criminal justice reforms even have a chance to work or even be implemented. Kerry Blakinger, an investigative journalist with The Marshall Project, wrote last week, last month, sorry, even when progressive prosecutors win voter support, establishment forces sometimes work to curb their power. From Virginia to Missouri to Texas to Georgia, conservatives have backed bills that are undermining the ability of elected prosecutors to carry out reforms that led voters to support them in the first place. And again, centrist Democrats seem to be dancing to a Republican tune, including in D.C., where most city council members are now on board with hiring more cops, a reversal from 2020 when they cut the size of the police force. With midterms around the corner, Democrats, as ever, want to self-flagellate and blame themselves for higher rates of homicide, even though the cold, hard facts tell a different story. Joining me now to discuss all of this is activist, author and host of the Pod Save the People podcast, D. Ray McKesson. He's also the co-founder of Campaign Zero, a non-profit that looks at reducing police violence. Uh, we also have John Pfaff, a law professor at Fordham University and author of Locked In. Thank you both for joining me. John, let me start with you and let me start with your most recent findings on all this. You looked at homicide numbers from dozens of police departments across the country from 2019 to 2020. What did you see? Have only Democratic-run cities become hotbeds of violent crime? Should we all be moving to Republican-run cities and states to be safe? I mean, to start with cities, it's hard to say Democrat versus Republican. So many cities are major cities are led by Democrats. So here I was looking at sort of progressive versus non-progressive. Some Democrats are very non-progressive. Some Republicans are progressive. And what I found, and others have found this as well, is that there's no connection between the progressiveness of a prosecutor and that this that city's change in, in homicide, right? That whatever is driving this, it's not progressive prosecutorial policies. How much do you think the pandemic is driving it, John? I mean, I think I think the pandemic's played a huge role in it. I think you no, know, the the pro you no, know, sorry, the unrest following George Floyd's murder in complicated ways contributed. You no, know, the police response would also create all sorts of violence. I think those things interact with each other in complicated kinds of ways. Um, I, I don't think we fully understand yet what happened in 2020. And I think different cities had different things happen. Um, but obviously, the pandemic is very much at, at the heart of, of all of this. Uh, DeRay, I want to play a clip from former New York City Police Commissioner on Morning Joe from Wednesday uh, following uh, Tuesday's shooting in Brooklyn. Have a listen to Bill Bratton. Who needs to get out of the way so Mayor Adams can make New York City safer again? Uh, the legislation in Albany, the city council, the progressive wings of those uh, uh, bodies, if you will. Uh, he has a real uphill struggle. The uh, progressive left uh, uh, criminal justice movement in this state has been disastrous. 2018 was the safest year in the history of New York City. 2019, the legislature in this state passed criminal justice reform. It's been a mess ever since. D. Ray, how would you respond to former Commissioner Bratton there? I mean, we should not ask Bill Bratton for anything, any views, because his plan was just to lock everybody up. When you look at the NYPD's own data, like, we don't have to do the analysis. They've already done it. When you look at their own data, they show that murders are down 36 percent at the year to day. Uh, at the week to date, they're down 23 percent. At the month to date, they're down 11 percent year to date. They're down at the 12 year and the 29 year. Murder, murder is down right now, according to NYPD's own data. So it's really hard because the fear mongering is something that people believe because they see these incidents. New York is the biggest city in the country, and the New York City Police Department's own data says that murder is at a historic low in so many ways. So Bill Braden is wrong on that. And Mayor Adams is, you know, I, I can't think of one thing that he has done that has been good in with regard to criminal justice. And for all the slack that de Blasio got, you know, de Blasio had arrest down at a record low, you know, like they were, the NYPD was not arresting a ton of people under de Blasio to his credit. I never thought that I would be a de Blasio fan at this moment, but, you know, Adams is out here bringing back stop and frisk was, in so uh, many ways, it looks like. John Kenneth Galbraith once said, when I look at George W. Bush, I miss Ronald Reagan. I feel shades of that in your uh, response there, dear. Uh, John, homicides have risen during the pandemic, about 25 percent from 2019 to 2020, which is huge. But that isn't the same as violent crime. And when it comes to violent crime, we're nowhere near the crime rates of the 1990s in places like New York. But people think it's like that because of the political narrative. As someone who studies this stuff, how frustrated do you get when you see this obsessiveness with defund the police, defund the police, defund the police? I feel like more people talk about defund the police than actually advocate it. 
I think that's true. I think you see that with bail reform also. And I think it's worth pointing out that the journalist Nick Wing actually pointed this out earlier this week. The one time the New York City Police Commissioner Dermot Shea stopped saying that bail reform was causing crime uh, was when he's in Albany testifying under oath. And suddenly at that <laughs> point, under oath, he suddenly said, well, the data is not really there, right? That there's no real connection. I think that's an important, important to realize. The police are they are a political entity here, right? They are, uh, you know, you know keeping on what defund means to the police. It's not happening, right? But about 90% of police spending is wages. So any call for defund is a call for de-staffing. That's going to make the unions very upset. They are a political force and they're fighting back like any other political entity would do when faced with kind of this existential threat to their, their, their status and, 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 their, and their power. And so, yes, it's, incredibly infuriating to see, but it's not coincidental, right? I think we, it's important to understand the politics there very much here. And there's one thing giving me hope these days is that I do see a shift in people's views on the police as a political entity, right? That the media is stopping their immediate acceptance of what the police say. They're being a bit more skeptical, a bit more critical, yeah. a bit more aware of the politics here. And I think that could have long run impacts that, that we haven't quite come to terms with it. Positive impacts that we haven't accepted yet, realized yet. And Dire, there are major recall campaigns for progressive prosecutors like George Gascone and uh, Chaser Boudin. But there's also Philadelphia's DA Larry Krasner, who won by huge margins last year, despite all the media backlash against reformist DAs. There's this conventional wisdom that voters don't want progressive prosecutors, but it depends where you are. Some of them are winning elections. Alvin Bragg in New York, Krasner in Philly. Yeah, Kim Fox in, in Cook County, right? She won, and everybody thought she was going to get taken out by what was happening in, in the media around that particular case. You know, the other thing that is never lost on me is that with increasing budgets, it's not like the police are solving more crimes. In Baltimore, the police say up front that they only plan to solve or clear 10 percent of burglaries in a given year. That's the goal in Baltimore. 10 percent clearance rate is the goal in Baltimore for burglaries. That is wild. You Could you imagine <laughs> what it would be like if we went around and told people the police are, they, they can't solve more than 10, but if we told you up front, the police start the year saying they're only going to solve 10% of the burglaries, they're only going to solve 40% of the murders. I mean, that's pretty wild. And to be the only agency in most cities that has gotten an increase time over time, there's not a major city in America, and correct me if I'm wrong, Professor, that is solving 90% of murders, that's solving no. 80%. I mean, we don't, that doesn't exist right now. Dire, before I go, I've got to jump back in. Quick last question. We're totally out of time, but I have to ask this. Uh, there is uh, the Louisiana State Supreme Court determined that a police officer was injured during a 2016 protest after the police killing of Alton Sterling, that that officer can sue you. He's alleging you're to blame because you orchestrated a demonstration at which he was injured. What's quickly, what is your response to that rather bizarre ruling? So we're going to go back to the Supreme Court. We are hoping that they reaffirm the Claiborne decision that gives uh, protest leaders... Uh, cover so that they, can't, they can't be sued civilly for these types of uh, things. And again, we don't even know if this guy was hit by a rock at all. Like, he didn't have to prove that he was hurt to even engage this. So we've been in it since 2016, and it looks like we'll be back at the Supreme Court. Good luck. It's a bizarre, bizarre ruling. Dangerous, even. Uh, D. Ray McKesson, John Faft, thank you both for your time today. I appreciate it.